for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Improving Health and Housing in Councils and Housing Associations with IOT. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our panel. Uh, firstly, we have Kenneth Barnsley, who is the for former public health consultant at Blackburn and Darwin Council. Ken has recently taken up a new position at Calderdale Council. His role includes healthy ageing, developing ac academic partnerships, applied research, population health, integrated public health intelligence, and supporting COVID response. Um, our other panel member is Helen Gibson. Helen is Group Head of Investment and Regeneration at In Communities. In Communities has over 20, 22,000 uh, homes in West and South Yorkshire, and is the largest social landlord in the Bradford district. Helen has a keen interest in the use of technology to improve asset management, tackle disrepair, and improve customer experience. And she's currently leading a project to explore the use of IoT in, in social housing. Um, our other panel member is founder and CEO of Republic of Things Limited. Um, Andrew, would you want, to, do you want to just quickly say a few words about Republic of Things before we kick off? Hi, Naomi. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, everybody else. Um, Republic of Things is a Northwest based company. Um, we work in the technology space in an area called the Internet of Things, which is basically the concept that in the future, everything will be connected to the Internet and be capable of providing data. Um, we're working predominantly with councils around issues of health and social care, but also with housing associations considering how digital can be used to transform how properties are managed and how services are delivered to the citizen. Thank you. Okay, so Ken, I'm going to come to you first. C can you describe um, the pressures uh, that an ageing population creates for the provision of health and care services? Yeah, the, I mean, in, in, in most of the parts of the country, the, the, the population is ageing. The Blackburn and Darwin, where I, I was working previously, actually had a very young population. But that doesn't mean that the, the, the older population isn't growing. And I know that having had a look at projections, the uh, 85 plus population was set to double. Um, and the, the, you know, the basics of most diseases is that as you get older, you're more at a greater risk of uh, having those. So particularly non-communicable diseases like heart disease, uh, dementia, cancers, um, respiratory disease, all of those things, the, the risk increases as, as you age. Uh, and in Blackburn and Darwin, where I, I've been working up to most recently, um, it's a very, um, a very young population, but uh, levels of long-term conditions are, are particularly high uh, in all of those groups age 50 plus. So our strategies were really starting to look at people age 50 plus as the, as the aging population. Um, and, and what we were also finding was that if you looked at the data for, for Blackburn and Darwin, you'd find that almost 6,000 people aged 65 plus lived on their own. Uh, so these are people that are much, much greater risk of non-communicable disease, heart disease, cancers, and so on, as I've, as I've described. Uh, and a greater need for services. So in the, in the work that we were doing, we started to look at how we could introduce some regular monitoring for those people uh, to try and link in with the services that currently provide for them. So we, you know, we've, we've uh, adopted an, a, a process of developing primary care groups uh, and primary care networks, of which there were four, each of those primary care networks, and they're being developed across the country uh, now as we speak, led by um, the, the healthcare sector, but in collaboration with local authorities, with housing associations, with uh, community and voluntary sector organisations in their patch. And they're all starting to try and look at and work together to deliver uh, improved health care just for that group of people who are uh, starting to age, more likely to get long-term conditions, and trying to understand ways that we can get early warning systems for them uh, earlier on in their kind of uh, disease pathway. So all of the, the Internet of Things is really, really helpful for all of that, because in particularly at the moment, because... Um, you know, we've just gone through 15 months of COVID and it looks like we're going to be having at least another month of it uh, in terms of restrictions. We've asked uh, our older people who are vulnerable to stay at home for all of that time. 
uh, and we're looking to develop ways of being able to contact them without having to go and knock on the door. And I think that's absolutely critical. So I've been testing some of those ways to, to try and monitor people. And I think that the really, really interesting thing for me was that when we set off doing some of the testing, we were really concerned that our residents would be worried about being monitored 24 hours a day, um, you know, by Big Brother, um, you know, with the, the sensors, which technically when you looked at them had a, an infrared eye on them. Uh, and although we, we know now it's not an infrared eye, it's a, it's a heat sensor that measures a warm uh, body coming into the room or a, or a kind of a human that can detect when a human comes into a room and leaves it. So get some idea of movement around the house, which is absolutely critical in terms of, uh, of conditioning and measuring condition, conditioning for that individual. Again, one of the issues as we come out of uh, of COVID is, is that level of deconditioning. So all of those issues in together, so the greater level of risk, the issues that we faced during COVID and trying to provide support without having large teams going knocking on doors uh, is a critical thing, I think. And, and when you sort of, when we talk about um, independent living and new models of care, what does that actually mean and how does it relate to the ageing population? <laughs> The, the thing for us, I think, was to, to be able to get some key flags via the, um, the Internet of Things. So the, the project that we put in place in, in one part of the borough in Darwin, we work very, very closely with the primary care network. We work very, very closely with the, uh, the integrated team. So that integrated team comprises physiotherapists, social workers, uh, this, uh, local nurses, occupational therapists, but it also included the respiratory nurses for the team. And the, the, one of the issues in Blackburn and Down is there, are, there is a higher incidence of respiratory disease, a uh, greater level of premature mortality. So it's a major issue in the area. And in particular, the respiratory nurses were particularly interested in the sensors that we were putting into people's homes. And, and, and our view was, you know, we know that there's all sorts of sensors you can have in the home now. You know, you can have your, your own home security. I've got it in my own house that comes to your phone. Mm -hmm. You can look at what's happening with your dogs in your house and all of those sorts of things. Absolutely fantastic. But the, the attraction with the work that we've done with the Republic of Things was to put in very, very simple sensors that measure three simple things. They measure movement, they measure temperature and they measure humidity. Uh, and in terms of providing early warnings and early flags to exactly that integrated neighborhood team, they're, they're really perfect. And we're starting to develop a system where effectively the, the concern or the flag from the sensor was creating a referral into that integrated team, which meets weekly. Mm -hmm. So they get referrals from all sorts of different places. So basically a referral about an individual tells you something about them, uh, a flag that's been noticed. Uh, and then that integrated team, of, as, as I say, physios, occupational therapists, social workers, and so on, they then decide each, each Wednesday for an hour what they're going to do with that individual, what package of support, how to support them in the home, or whether it's just for continuing observation. So the digital referral is exactly the same. So in other words, if somebody's got the sensors in the house, and the temperature drops below 15 degrees for a certain length of time, that's part of the nice guidance that uh, temperature of less than 15 degrees, that will exacerbate certain conditions, particularly respiratory conditions. So really interesting. The respiratory nurses who are part of that integrated team are really, really interested in this and going, that'd be great. That provides us something, some, um, some empirical evidence that we can go and contact that person and see if they need support. So it's a really a way of triaging and keeping an eye on people in a way that you can't really do with, you know, with a with a with a team going out knocking on doors. So there's some critical things there in relation to non-communicable disease, which I think are, are really, really important. And they were seen as being that by the integrated neighborhood teams. Okay, we had to put a little bit of a hold on it because of COVID, because mm -hmm. they've been off doing other things. That all those people have probably been doing vaccinations and stuff like that. But now we're starting to really pick that up again. The time is really, really good for it, I think. Uh, and it'll create some great benefits. Thank you. I, um, I, think, um, I think Ken identifies a number of kind of characteristics or, or challenges there. 
that I think are going to be themes throughout the conversation. I, I think you know, the first one I picked up on was the need for a solution to be scalable. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about nationally, if you scope out the experience in Blackburn with Darwin, you know, you are talking about millions of people. Yeah. And, and it is a problem that is growing. So that cost and that burden is only going to increase over time. And, and I also thought the other thing that was really interesting from Ken's experience in the project was this question of integration. That, that it's all well and good having data but how do you transform that into useful information and use it in a meaningful way that can transform the service you're delivering to the person and produce better outcomes for that individual? And I think that those key things are really going to be a feature of this discussion throughout. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Helen, I'm going to come to you. Um, you work for an organisation that provides thousands of homes to people. Um, recently, the um, legislative landscape has changed and housing associations now have a much greater responsibility of how their homes affect their tenants' health and well-being. How is the housing sector, sector responding to these changes? I think, Naomi, for um, the two main pieces of legislation, bearing in mind I'm sort of asset-focused, is the Homes yeah. Fit for Habitation Bill and also the future home standards. So the way in which we've looked at these sensors is really a two-pronged approach. So for the homes fit for habitation, it's about the relative humidity and ambient temperature information we get from the sensors. And um, that has assisted us in looking at disrepair claims that we receive from solicitors that operate within our homes. And that does affect a lot of um, registered social landlords across across the area um, and also for the sustainability agenda um, aligning the data that we're getting to support retrofitting pilots that we're also doing looking at the whole house approach and looking at costing use and the way that our customers use their homes linking into that we have the uh, a fuel poverty strategy and as uh, Ken's touched on making referrals for information and guidance on how to use space and water heating, helping people with their bills, for example, and that's across the whole customer profile, um, including vulnerable and older customers, but it has touched people that perhaps as an organisation didn't necessarily know had a problem until we've utilised these sensors, so they've been really, really useful. Um, um, sorry? Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, I was just, I was going to ask you just uh, the question, just sort of just to add into that, because obviously, you know, Ken, you you look at people independent living. Um, Helen, you're obviously looking at um, health and well-being, but also the asset management. So, my question to both of you is is also how important is high quality housing to the occupants of health around health and well-being? How important is that, especially around uh, independent living, but also health and well-being of the tenants? I think if I, if I can answer first, Ken, I don't want to butt in. Um, for um, for health and well-being, it does have value for money implications. So reducing turnover, reducing um, rent arrears, for example, where people are struggling. So we're interceding where perhaps uh, before a crisis point within that tenancy. Um, certainly um, disrepair claims for us as an organisation are a significant business risk and disproportionate in the value of claims to the number of repairs that we receive. So you're looking on average for in communities at £8,000 per settled disrepair claim, which is quite significant. Smaller organisations, that, that, um, that is quite a different difficult cash flow so so I would say that these are a really good solution um, across the range of customers and assets. Yeah. Ken as regards to sort of health and well-being what are your your uh, thoughts on this especially having you know making sure that that, that that you have healthy homes? Yeah I mean I, I mean the home is absolutely critical I mean you know the, um, you know we work with a, a kind of social determinants of health uh, approach to health to population health and I think that's the that's a critical thing here it's not necessarily about individual health it's about the health of the population uh, and we know as you know as Andrew says that in you know in Blackburn and Darwin there's you know between uh, around about 6,000 people aged 65 plus 
um, who live alone. Uh, and we know from all of our the background research that all of those people are highly likely to have multiple conditions and therefore to, to utilize health services to, uh, to you know, to, to have um, incidents in, in urgent care, all of those things, which is all uh, having a cost uh, and providing pressures onto our uh, health and care system. So if there are things that we can do to, to prevent those and to do things earlier on uh, to improve people's health and to help them to improve. So there are key things about the environment of the home. Yeah, and cold and damp are critical in that, both of which uh, exacerbate respiratory disease, or exacerbating factors for heart disease, and all of those non-communicable diseases. It's, it's absolutely critical that we can do that. And just in, in, in terms of the, the sort of the costs and the benefits, we did have a quick look at um, kind of the social care costs and the, the, the main study that we looked at suggested that for an adult 65 plus living alone, the, the annual average social care cost is around about, um, around about 600 a year. So if we can uh, implement the sensors and offset some of that cost through earlier action prevention interventions with individuals, then great. Um, and our, our approach really was to take, um, to take a, a population health approach. So the, the, um, the criteria for, for having one of the sensors was purely that you had to be aged over 50 and living alone. So that was our kind of uh, to test it all out rather than a lot, of the, a lot of the work that we're seeing in terms of population health is focusing on people who've already got existing conditions, uh, looking at the data from GP uh, practices for people with CBD, for people with um, uh, lung uh, issues and respiratory disease, and then focusing on them. We're actually focusing on the broader population so that we're trying to intervene in advance of people uh, developing more serious conditions of, of the disease. And again, I think it's interesting looking at the commonality across both health and housing. You know, you're both interested in what Ken described as the broadly determinants, but for perhaps slightly different reasons. But I think you know what that means to me is that issues around disrepair and issues around tenant well-being are inherently linked. You know, they're, they're completely inseparable. I think they're two sides of the same coin. Um, but again, the other message that's coming across very strongly is this need to act earlier. Yeah, how can we possibly make a low cost intervention now that might mitigate against more expense at some point further down the line? So you've got these characteristics that are emerging that are almost describing the challenges and the solution that needs to be put in place. And also the acknowledgement that the value that these solutions produce, the data, mm. can be used across the organisation in many different ways. I think that that's, again, another incredibly important feature that we're describing today. Yeah, definitely. Um, Helen, you um, recently conducted a, a very large wellbeing survey of your tenants. What were the key points that you'd taken away from that? And did you see a link between housing and health and well-being? Yes, so um, my neighbourhood services colleagues within the business at the start of COVID did quite an extensive telephone survey with our customers. And the main items that we took away for that were, which um, Ken has touched on, social isolation. And that was irrespective of age. And that included families. So you may have single parent families um, where they've engaged within their community, children have gone to school and that highlighted some real issues there. Um, also financial inclusion and fuel poverty that I've touched on. So um, there were things such as internet usage, access to um, you know, learning materials, etc., for children at school. Um, and linked to that is people were in their homes a lot more and the heating and maintenance of those properties or, or the heating certainly um, was something that registered with our customers and that's why this pilot was particularly useful to our, we have a, a dedicated financial inclusion team um, to try and highlight what referral pathways into partner organizations were available so they, they were the main um, 
sort of feedback that we got from our customers. And, and there were things around there which were really, really um, challenging as a business. And, and other housing providers will, will um, have had the same issues. And it's things around, say, for example, access to food banks. And in the early days of COVID, um, there was um, issues around how do we get that because a lot of customers do depend on that provision um, and it was about working in partnership and we actually set up with some key partners and the uh, primary care trust for example um, a, food, a food bank within um, within Bradford City Centre and used our operatives to go and deliver to our customers um, and actually widen that out to not just in communities, tenants, to others in need within the, in the business. So that was um, sort of a reactive, I would have to say, in, you know, reactive, good piece of work. Um, a lot of people did good work um, around the challenges that COVID brought. So, um, so we are planning to do that next year as well to sort of track the findings um, and see how things have moved on and if we've still got um, sort of those issues and if we can improve those pathways. And with the sort of uh, the information that, that you got from, from the survey, and obviously you're going to do one again, does this mean um, that you have to manage your homes in a different way? Um, I think that, well, um, income collection, certainly um, some of the changes there have included, um, we've always done, say, text messaging, um, you know, phone calls, etc. But obviously, um, on site visits were slightly reduced uh, due to COVID and people um, not going out into our neighbours as much. Um, but the way that we've found um, engagement with customers particularly through social media has changed and we've we've used that um platform a lot more i think again you know, we'll bring it back to a kind of a technology perspective um, and i'm sure can similar experience that this need for robust and remote data collection when possibly you can't deliver your services to your tenants or your citizens in the way that you otherwise would you know, that, that, that remote pair of eyes, for, for want of a better word, I think is, is very interesting. I think COVID-19 really underscores the importance of that. Um, what we see in the sector as a whole, and both house and housing, is, you know, the digital transformation agenda is really um, paramount and at the forefront of decision makers thinking about how they manage the delivery of their services, their assets, look after their people. And, and I think the way that I would describe it in housing, and Helen touched on the Home Fitness for Habitation Act earlier, it is a move to a much more human-centric type approach, a, a move away from looking at the home as just bricks and mortar to a much more sophisticated need to understand how that property is affecting the tenant. And, and how the behaviours of the tenant are affecting the property at the same time. And as a consequence, you know, tailoring the services and tailoring the interventions that are made to actually meet the person's real need. Um, and it comes back to this point again, that the disrepair, the conditions within a home, so often just reflect very, very complicated underlying causes that may have nothing to do with the actual fabric of the building or its condition at all. Um, Andrew, just a quick question. Um, you and Republic of Things were, were born out of um, City Verve. Um, and what you have, have created uh, was very much in, in response to, to, to problems that housing associations and councils were having around this. Um, how have you seen, um, you know, since you, since you started it a, a couple of years ago, um, the, the, the problems that you're solving change? Um, I, I don't necessarily think the problems have changed because I think the problems have always been there. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that housing quality as a whole across the UK is very checkered. Um, a recent study by some colleagues in Manchester have indicated that you know, the cost of the NHS for quality housing is at least £2.5 billion pounds per annum. And that's probably actually double that in reality. I, I think what we see now is um, a growing shift 
to recognise the importance of digital within organisations like councils, NHS trusts, and within the housing associations. And that then creates the opportunity there to reconsider how services are delivered to the individual. And, and I think what things like the Home Fitness for Habitation Act, the, the Care Act as well, in regards to how services delivered through councils, have placed much greater obligation on these organisations to deal with these issues in a much more proactive way than they possibly might have considered previously. And when you think about that in the context of population health, then it dictates that you have a very, very different approach to how you deliver your services than you possibly have in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question for, for both uh, Ken and Helen. Um, so it strikes me that the, the provision of care and the management of housing, there's a real problem of scale. Uh, many thousands of people in many thousands of homes um, you know, can technology play a role in helping you reach these people? And that's a question to both of you. Um, Go on, Helen. All right. Okay. What I would say is um, we, we're we operating a pilot, but you're absolutely correct. Um, putting sensors within 21,000 homes is... is um, an ultimate ambition, I would say, but um, what we've done is stratify our stock and use the data, say, for example, within our non-trad homes to find the learning. So say, for example, overheating was a particular issue, which is quite a difficult conversation sometimes with customers. And it's about that uh, information piece. And so if we know within a certain stock or a certain customer profile that they tend to have their heating on, that's an imp impact on their income, but we can tailor information or marketing pieces to people within that that stock profile and that's quite useful so don't get me wrong it may affect 60 percent of, of that cohort but it still means that we may be able to make a difference um, which links into the future home standard decarbonization and the sustainability agenda for the business as well as fuel poverty for that customer and and sometimes it is a, i'm just thinking about two particular cases you know until we actually explained and we got a surveyor to go and explain they don't need to boost the heating let it cool down boost it mm -hmm. again maintain an ambient temperature and that made it, it doesn't sound a lot perhaps to some people but it was 10 pounds a week yeah. on somebody's bill that's a lot of money when you're on a low income so yeah. that's that's the approach that we've taken as i say initially in the pilot um there is a digitalization strategy within in communities but there's lots of strands to that around access for customers etc but but these senses have have been an internal um an internal tool that we can use to say look at these benefits on lots of different strands so it's been great for us personally within Thank investment and region Thank you, Helen. Um, Kenneth, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think I'd say there's probably two two key areas really. The first, the first one is the data itself, um, and I, I think one of the things that we perhaps struggled with a little bit previously with with systems like telecare and so on was that uh, local authorities didn't actually have access to the data. We had a good service there, mm. but we didn't have access to the data, so you could not as a public health person, look at the epidemiology of it and look at the patterns across the population by location and all of those things. So I think one of the critical things, and we've, you know, we've had so much learning through COVID, but now as a, as a public health consultant, we've got so much data available in terms of COVID that tells us you know, who, who's uh, tested positive, hospitalizations, mortality, and we can do that very, very detailed uh, epidemiological analysis to enable us to target our strategies uh, and policies in real time virtually we can do that you know we've got this, the data day by day and I think that's the critical thing with the sensors is um, the agreement with the, the, the customer the person who lives there with the local authority and with the provider and in this case you know Republic of Things to make sure that we've got access to the data to be able to analyze it in the ways that want to do that's absolutely critical i think the other thing is in in the design of services 
uh, and designing new services to almost to adapt to what the sensors can provide. And, you know, it, it's all very well me, a public health person saying, oh, these sensors are fabulous. You know, they can measure movement around the home. They measure um, temperature and they measure humidity. But actually, when you put that in front of an occupational therapist or a respiratory nurse or a, a physio or a district nurse or a social worker, they think about the data that it might provide in a totally different way because of their experience, professionalism, knowledge, and perspective on an individual case. So I think there's great insights to be gained. And that's what we've tried to do, is to talk to all of those people who are part of those integrated neighborhood teams to say, what could you get out of it? And we've had some really interesting and unexpected things. You know, we had um, uh, 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 one of the professionals said, oh yeah, I've got this guy. Um, uh, and, you know, we know he has problems with, uh, with leg ulcers. Um, and when he's not doing that, um, he's, he's out drinking. So if we can get information about whether he is or is, isn't in the house, that will enable us to tailor our specific intervention with that individual. So there's some specific things and then some very, very large programs. But I think those insights from those individual professionals and the co-design of how we utilize this new thing, I think are really, really important. And I think that's a, that's a critical part of our approach. And Andrew, you know, just, just on what Kenneth has just said about, especially with the co-design, how closely do you work with um, housing associations and councils um, when you first having that, those initial uh, conversations, but then obviously moving on to pilots and, and scaling? Again, it goes back all the way back to sort of everything you mentioned right at the start of the area. Um, CEVA is a very collaborative project funded by Innovate UK. Um, but one of the big things for us was that it gave us access to um, expert practitioners in health and social care. Um, and so that element of co creation and collaboration has always been a really, really strong feature of what we do. And, and we feel now that the experience of um, working with those people to help us shape our commercial model, um, how we manage things like data and, and the very kind of ethical type of approach that I think we like to, we like to promote around its use is very, very important. Um, but also as well in the selection of the metrics that we monitor, you know, the temperature, the humidity and the movement. These weren't just selected at random, they were selected as key indicators from which the maximum amount of insight could be derived from health and, and, and housing providers. So it's been an absolutely essential part of, of what we do. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to pick up on something that both Helen and Ken said. You know, it was fantastic to, to hear the real world story you know, that, that actually this technology, which sometimes can be seen as kind of quite depersonalizing, actually having a benefit for people in, in very real terms. I don't think that that's fantastic. Um, but I just want to point out the importance also as well of effective analytics. You know, the, the, we started off talking about scale, managing many, many thousands of homes. And in order to do that effectively, what you really need to be doing is focusing on the exceptions. Um, and the only way that you can really do that is through the effective use of data and having a seamless integration path so that you can ingest and use that data in a meaningful way, but also having a platform and a system where the analytics are sophisticated enough so that you can pinpoint those houses where conditions are not quite right and you can begin to triage and manage those issues. Uh, and the second, the final point as well was around how you're both using data to, to stratify and better understand both your your people and your assets. I, I thought that that was very interesting because that stratification risk, I think, is really at the heart of triage. You know, until you have that information, how can you start to make some of the bigger decisions that you might need to make? Thank you, Andrew. Um, so this is a question to, to both um, Ken and Helen. Um, so, so when considering, um, you know, technical response to, to the issues that we, we've talked about, um, 
what is important to you? So, you know, are you looking, obviously cost effective, ease of installation, you've got GDPR, compliancy about it being digitally inclusive. What's been really important to, 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 to you when, when deciding um, to use technology? Um, for, um, for us, certainly GDPR is the most important um, aspect. Um, the ease of installation, the way that we use them, because it's linked to the asset, so they're unobtrusive. We have a flexibility, so they're not a fixed item, so we can move them after a set period of time, dependent on the need, which enables us to reach a wider audience of, of our customers. Um, and value for money. So Andrew's just talked about that powerful narrative that we can give on individual case studies. But what really sells um, is obviously showing the return on our investment and being able to use data to show that. So yeah, it, it, you know, we do use those case studies when we're feeding back and when we're publicizing, et cetera. But having that data to, to use and inform um, our actions is really, really powerful. So like I say, value for money, I think, for, for this, because we did a cost benefit analysis, et cetera, um, and being able to, to do that has been key. Thank you, Helen. What about you, Ken? I think the big thing that I flagged with, with technology is that, you know, the technology is, it's easy, it's good. You put it in somebody's home and it, you know, it, it provides the data, that's great. I, I think the critical thing is the, the organizational change that you need to support it. Uh, and I think that takes quite quite a lot of doing really. I mean, we've, ours is a, is a pilot, it is one primary care neighborhood, you know, with a population of about 40,000 people, you know, one large GP practice and a, and a few other, uh, sorry, G, uh, health center, which serves that area. But then the critical thing is the partnership and how those partnerships work together. So on that partnership, on that integrated neighbourhood team, yes, you've got local authority and social workers and so on. You've got the health sector, you've got the occupational therapists and all of those allied health professionals. But you've also got the community and voluntary sector involved in there. So some of the, some of the larger community and voluntary sector providers are absolutely critical. And working out how those organisations work together to deliver effectively what is a new service centered on a sensor. That piece of organizational development is absolutely critical. And within that, you have to focus on the co-design and making sure that that group of people find something of great value for them. You know, the analysis suggests the cost benefit, yet we'll get value out of that. There, there is, there should be a saving over and above the actual implementation cost. So that's great but it needs to be something that's adopted uh, and taken on board by those professionals who are then working very closely with the individuals. And so having those people who actually know the patch, I think is critical. But then the other thing, yeah, it's a pilot, so it's a hundred homes. So thinking about how we fund rollout. So for Lancashire, for example, 80,000 people aged um, 65 plus living alone. So if we're thinking, right, we're going to roll it out to 80,000 people, how do we scale up the cost? How do we address the budgetary concerns? As a pilot, yeah, we can always find a bit of money to do a pilot, you know, 50,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds or whatever. But to roll out at that scale, it needs a change of thinking from the strategists as well as from the implementers. Yeah, because it's looking, it's looking at, you know, just, just um, some of the stuff that both of you have, have described. Um, it, it's 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 way more than just the information that you get as um, you know you're you're talking um, Ken about um, a, a much wider uh, audience of people that that can use that data, but also how yeah. they can um, intervene. Um, and then obviously Helen, the same with you. It, it's looking at that bigger picture um, about long term. Um, uh, instigation of also cost savings and, and weighing that up um, and yeah I think f for me I suppose Andrew I'm going to throw this into your corner now um, when you are looking um, at, at, at scaling um, beyond pilots how, how are Republic of Things um, looking at that? 
Well, I think, again, I'd like to just reference what both Ken and Helen said in the previous answers. Uh, I think that understanding the value of the data within the organisation as a whole is very, very important. Um, because I think the value of the information that we produce becomes exponentially greater if you are able to share it and use it in conjunction yeah. with the data sets that you already have. And so I think what that really underscores there is the importance of this kind of integrated approach, not just from a technical perspective around, you know, is the data presented in a format that I can use, but aligning all of the stakeholders within the business to understand where the value can be realized. Because I think, you know, the interesting thing that, you know, that Helen was talking about around, specifically around issues of, of disrepair, but then also then went on to talk about well, how that can also impact things like render risk, for example. Uh, and how Ken was saying that actually, if he shares the data with one partner who's got a specific interest in, say, respiratory health, the value that they extract from the data might be completely different than, say, from a physiotherapist or an occupational health um, professional. So I think the challenge is, again, it all comes back to this question of digital transformation yeah. and developing a fully rounded view of the value of the business within the organisation. And then if you are able to do that, I, I'm sure that it will unlock its value and potential. So far. And, it, and it's looking at how those sort of early indicators um, uh, might affect how services can be delivered but also um, the potential benefits. I think it, it's it's really what's been really wonderful to hear from Helen and, and Ken is is um, those real stories uh, because they're really powerful and they're really powerful examples. But also, you know, talking about how um, other um, third parties that, that you work alongside of um, how they've been able to interpret the data and how it's been useful to them. Um, Thank you so much um, for your time this morning. Um, it's been a really interesting conversation. Um, any closing comments, Andrew? Um, yeah, you know, I'd just like to, again, go back to my earlier point about you know, how we might characterize the conversation and some of the kind of takeaways that I've picked up on it today. Um, and, and I think, again, it goes back to this issue of scale. It, it goes back to, surfacing actionable information within your organization and being able to make a, an appropriate response at the earliest possible stage to mitigate against those potential costs. Um, and all of that needs to be driven by a cost-effective solution that enables you to capture that data, to realize that return on investment, coupled with those analytics and those artificial, that artificial intelligence that actually enables you just to respond to the moments of crisis and not to all of the other millions of data points that might potentially spread for us in the organisation. Um, and, and, and being able to wrap that up with some of the stories that we've heard today and to put that human face on it, um, mm -hmm. it's been absolutely brilliant. So, so thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Helen. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. And this is the end of our session. Thank you. Thank you.